Oh, I recognize some of these people. Welcome. Look at all these nice people. See a lot of, see a lot of uh, dudes wearing hats on Zoom calls. Lots of everyone wearing hats on Zoom calls. I have not been able to trick anyone into cutting my hair. Um, so this is what you get. <laughs> So we're going to wait just a little bit um, for the late folks to, I don't know where they're coming from, what they could possibly be doing right now that would make them late, but we'll just uh, proceed um, like a normal meeting of people in the conservation world. Um, oh, look at all these friendly faces. Remember when we were outside? That was cool. Um, so yeah, we are going to have everyone muted and hopefully you won't hear my toddler screaming um, as we get this thing going. But uh, for some of you um, who have your, your cameras on, I think that's great. I love seeing that you all still exist. Um, and um, just know that if you do have your camera on, that it is on and we have some folks here who will shut your camera off if something untoward starts happening. Um, and uh, if you have started seeing a little blinking orange box, um, that is the chat box that is open that we would love for you to use to interact with the presentations tonight. Um, Evan shaved again, that's a good choice. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, welcome. Trevor did not shave, also a good choice. Um, sorry, I'm commenting on all of your facial hairs. Maybe I'm insecure about mine. Uh, so yeah, feel free. To, oh, look at that, people are already chatting. Um, they're already saying things to each other. Um, yeah, so this is gonna be a lot of fun. I've gotten a preview all the talks tonight and none of them are horrible. Um, I have a very high standard. Uh, and yeah, we, we are very excited to, to come together around this idea that we like plants. Um, so I am Rob Telfer, as it says in all caps uh, underneath my face. And I am the adult, oh, Rachel Goad. Rachel Goad left us to have a cat in Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, yeah, I, uh, I work at the Morton Arboretum and in their adult learning programs division. And I like plants too. And so we are coming together to help folks, uh, you know, get their fix. Uh, I am, every time someone posts a picture of a spring ephemeral that I can't see, um, uh, part of my soul uh, shatters. And so this is gonna help uh, restore my soul shards. Um, I don't know if that's referring to me or not. Uh, and so um, we are gonna uh, get going in a second and please feel free to use the chat function. Um, the way this is gonna work is we're gonna have presentations from I still don't know if that's me. Um, if we're gonna have presentations from five beautiful creatures and uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions um, in, the, uh, in the chat and we'll try to get uh, everyone's attention so that those questions can be answered in a timely way. And we'll also do some Q and A at the end. And I should mention that this is being recorded. So if you are uninterested in being a part of history, um, you know, you can mute your camera now. And 
yeah, this is being presented by Audubon Great Lakes and we're very excited that they put this whole forum together for us. And what do we think, uh, Kristen and Terry? Should we start this party? Daniel says yes. I didn't ask him, but yeah, good. Um, okay, yeah, thumbs up. That works. Um, you can also uh, do this. Hey. All right, so um, I am very excited that we are coming together for this. I am not wearing sweatpants for the first time in what seems like forever, and it's very, very great. So we're going to talk about all the plants of the Chicago wilderness um, and hopefully leave you feeling a little bit hopeful about all the good news that plants can bring into our lives. We are going to get started with a genius who is the stewardship manager at Indian Brown Boundary pra Prairies um, in Markham, Illinois. It's Travis Kunzelman, and he has a lot of pretty pictures to show you and also pretty words to drop on you. And so uh, we'll do the, um, this is how I've been doing Zoom uh, applause. Uh, do the ASL applause thing where you shake your hands like that so people know that you're excited. So everyone, make some noise for Travis Kunzelman. Thanks, Rob. This thing on, you guys got it there? Wave your hands again. Well, uh, yeah, thanks everybody. It's kind of crazy to see so many cool people. I've, uh, I haven't seen for a long time. Thank you. Um, so I was initially planning to be a Segway person here, but I'm, t I'm starting off. So forgive my, uh, my rough start, but let me, let me jump into it. How's, how's this? It looks great. So, yeah, Rob, Rob told you, I'm Travis Kunzelman. I work for the Nature Agency in uh, Illinois. Uh, Indian Boundary Prairies is our project in Markham. It's also known as the Markham Prairies. So this will be a little less about that and more about uh, the plants that are growing there and uh, mostly about uh, my pictures of milkweeds that I like to take every year, all the time. But uh, actually more so their ecological significance as a specialized, diverse group of indicators of habitats and soils and how they inform our research and restoration about the uh, authenticity of tall grass remnants we have here. So those first two maps were just about a uh, uh, hundred years of progress in the, uh, the Markham area, which is just south of Chicago. Um, Indian Boundary Prairies uh, is the blank spot on the map here. So that's Markham and Midlothian, just south of Chicago. Uh, mostly I wanna show you how it's the Lake Plain right there. You can see the moraine in pretty exquisite uh, detail. So that, blank spot with all the topographic shadings and marsh borders where IBP is now a fragmented but clustered group of remnants in the lake plain. It's about uh, 500 acres altogether. Uh, Bob Betts, professor at Northeastern Illinois University, uh, discovered the, the original tract in the 60s. Here on the left, Jack White did the Illinois Natural Inventory in the 70s. Got those squiggly areas started to map out and then in the 80s on the right we made up a master plan for uh, how we're gonna begin to protect and restore the whole place. A couple of years later, we got satellites and LIDAR that kind of helped us know what we were looking at a little more accurately. 
And then we're able to do a lot of science and really nail down what's going on with the soils, chemistry, water flow, et cetera. And that lets us make maps like this to uh, make a management plan and go on to protect biodiversity. So enough of that. Um, the point of all that is how it's great and it really guides our work. But when it comes down to it, we like to go out there and uh, try and figure out what we're looking at. Um, the lake plain is so flat that uh, the mat, the, the, those topographic lines of five feet make all the difference between the dry sand ridges and uh, the deep marshes sometimes. So the milkweeds are just so awesome. They really show us what we're looking at and they're elusive and mysterious. Let's start with the uh, swamp milkweed here. Um, almost the most common one. Uh, but it's it's unique in its uh, in its wetland habitat. It's the uh, really the only wetland milkweed that uh, that stands in the water, and that's its that's its niche out there. The rest of them are fairly upland. Um, so that's the first of eight that are on our site. And let's uh, kind of move through the spectrum. This is a uh, Sullivan milkweed, Sclepias sullivantii. We call it prairie milkweed here. It's just, it's just a glory to behold. The flowers are the largest. That leaf is just waxy. Um, so this inhabits the more of the swales in the marsh getting a little upland here you can tell these are the grassy areas that tend to burn more regularly and they'll dry out in the middle of the summer uh, moving up out of the wetlands uh, the most some of the most fascinating ones here are the butterfly milkweed and the short green milkweed they just have such a interesting niche. Neither of them are ever abundant with us. They just really need some sort of reduced competition. They're always just nestled in with the, the Clastius associates here up on the dry sand ridge and they're just never abundant and the short green may be the most elusive. We don't have that open structure that it seems to need. And then we're just so surprised to find the Butterfly milkweed growing on black soil too sometimes. Uh, moving along to the purple milkweed, this one is regarded as a savanna plant. We think of it as our savanna thicket one. It's growing in a burned over thicket here, just, just to our surprise, blooming away in a black soil habitat amongst uh, shrubs that create this tension zone that we're, we're not sure what to do with it. We don't want to aggressively kill shrubs unnecessarily, especially when we realize these things are kind of dependent on that fluctuating shade community. These two really uh, show the spectrum here, maybe you know, highest, the lowest quality, um, but to dry in a way, but also rich to sterile soils. They all, they all have their place and they really let us know what we're looking at. And let's not forget common milkweed. It's kind of exquisite symmetry here. And it's a great champion that is accessible to everybody. This is not an IBP picture, but common milkweed is just great. And uh, we hope to, if we ever find Regal fritillaries here will be checking all the milkweeds. This is an IEP picture. This is kind of a little competition of us to see who can get the most Acadian hair streaks in one shot. This is not the record. This is only eight, but still very nice to see. Um, let me go back to the tall green here as it is one of the most fascinating ones. Um, it's growing in standing water here with Juncus. Um, that's not typical. This is a little, a little harder to track down what this indicates, but it's 
undoubtedly really high quality. So we just hope that we can manage everything right to get the little shoots to sprout up out of the bluets in the spring. And uh, we hope that it makes it to that glorious stage of uh, fruit pod production there with a little autumn color at the end of the year. And uh, then hopefully it's uh, in a habitat where that that windborne seed can disperse and find its place wherever it may be and hopefully it doesn't blow off site. Um, so indeed we want to pick that seed sometime and uh, you know strip the silk off the hairs and uh, put that seed directly on the sites where we know the habitat is right. But of course that is if we know the habitat it needs. So. Um, I don't know how many minutes that was, but Rob, jump in if you got if you got a question. Or... I, I got a question. Um, so there's like there's a few more milkweeds that are native to uh, northeastern Illinois. Are there any others that the site may have supported at one time or could support in the future? Yeah, that's a good question. So we have eight on the record. Um, there, there may have been, there's probably sand milkweed at some point. You could guess, no records of that, but as far as the habitats we have protected now, um, I think I think eight pretty much paints the picture of what we're working with. Bob Betts was famous for his, uh, his work on Mead's milkweed, by the way. I think there were a couple sites in Illinois, uh, but he would go all the way to Kansas, I believe, to to study that one. Um, I don't think we had, have anything quite like that around now. Um, and then the other thing I would ask is what is the, uh, Erica, you sent me that privately. So you only sent it to me that you like oval milkweed. Um, so I appreciate that private message. There you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess the only other question I had personally is, you know, the nature preserves there are really great, not just for their milkweed. So what is the most surprising thing you've seen out there? Oh, well, yeah, good question. You know, I take milkweeds just as they're a, a, a fascinating little family and sort of a, a megaflora, but uh, let's see, you know, we, we, we find a surprise every, every year, you know. Um, uh, the the sundew, the carnivorous sundew, was re long recorded for the site. Um, that was that was unknown for maybe about twenty years till a couple of years ago. Um, we found that growing associating with uh, the tall green milkweed uh, about about three years ago now. Cool, that's amazing. Did you feed it anything? <laughs> It, it it looked to be well fed. Uh, we we got to monitor it better, but we only you know kept an eye on it after after a couple decades. And uh, yeah, it's full of bugs. It's eating down there in its sandy ditch. Um, very cool plant too. Yeah, we've had a couple questions about native gardening, uh, and one really good one for shade is one that Daniel Suarez pointed out, the uh, Asclepius exaltata, which is not in your slideshow. Um, no, nope. that's fine. Poke, well, poke, poke milkweed, beautiful woodland plant we don't have. Well, that's great. Okay, well, we'll keep it moving, um, but I'm sure there's going to be actually a lot more opportunity to talk about uh, good native plants for home gardens. Um, but I'd say in general, find ones on nursery sites that you think are pretty and start there. Because um, that's how uh, the first one should be free and then addictions go on from there. So uh, coming up next, actually wait, first before I transition, can we all get a round of applause for Travis? Let's do the, hey, hey. Um, that was really great. Uh, moving on, we have uh, our darling, mustachioed friend from Audubon Great Lakes, 
Um, he is, are you, what are you, stewardship something, something? What's your title? Steward yeah, I'm the stewardship program manager. Stewardship program manager. Um, he's also just a, a delicate soul um, and one of the most uh, generous people with his knowledge and his, um, his time than, uh, in this whole community that I've ever met. And I'm really grateful to him for everything that he's taught me. So now he is going to teach you. It's Daniel Suarez, everyone. Give it up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rob. And if Terry, if you can get my presentation shared up there, I'll have Terry click through the slides. But yeah, just building off of what Rob said, thank you for the nice words. Um, everything that I'm going to be presenting here, uh, none of this is original research of mine, but it's part of the collective knowledge that um, that volunteer stewards and dedicated staff that's working in the region kind of all contribute to to help create our, our collective ecological knowledge. So uh, jumping into my presentation, I'm going to talk about two things that you might not have ever related to one another before. I'm going to talk about some parasitic plants and uh, a couple of grassland bird species that I spend a lot of time thinking about and, and helping restore habitat for here at Audubon. Um, and so while these plants are pretty diminutive, the ones we're going to be talking about, they play a pretty outsized role in grassland bird conservation. Next slide, Terry. So this is the type of habitat I usually find myself in during the growing season. I feel extremely lucky uh, to be Audubon Stewardship Program Manager and to be able to work in some of the most amazing natural areas in our region. Um, so at Audubon, one of our focal habitats are these large grasslands. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar, grasslands are simply grass-dominated ecosystems like prairies. Um, there's certainly an underappreciated ecosystem locally and globally. Um, it's one of the most, uh, one, of, one of the largest uh, ecosystems on the planet. It, it expands across six continents. Um, its role in carbon sequestration is massive, um, yet we usually tend to associate a lot of those benefits with, with forests instead of prairies. Um, most people don't know that this grassland, which is at Orland grassland, just about 45 minutes south of downtown Chicago, um, exists in our backyard and, and these are important strongholds, important habitats, not only for the Chicago region but regionally for some, of, for some of these species. And these are laboratories, these are places where volunteers, interns, staff, uh, monitors are all contributing to the knowledge of and, uh, and, and the amount of management that these grasslands see is really, really high compared to what you would find in a million acre grassland complex out west. So there's a lot we can learn about the interfaces between the management we're performing and the way that the grassland birds are responding. Um, so um, additionally, I work with the land managers and the landowners and, and we, we ask questions, research questions uh, that we can try to track long term, try to understand how the birds are responding to management and how we need to adjust both county by county, region by region, and then, you know, this entire Chicago wilderness area. Uh, try, to, try to think of our grasslands as a, sing as a single entity. Next slide. So here's a, here's a little map showing uh, some of the publicly owned grasslands. So these are mostly forest preserve districts, some Illinois DNR, uh, U.S. Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service lands in a six county region around Chicago. Um, in, this, in this footprint, we have about 33,000 acres of grasslands. Um, and in, in the state that is known as the Prairie State, Illinois, uh, about 200 years ago, we had 22 million acres of this, of this habitat, huge unbroken expanses of prairie extending as far as the eye can see. In the 1970s, scientists went out to try to figure out how many of those 22 million acres were left. And depressingly, they only found about 2,000 acres of remnant prairie left. And, and when we say remnant prairie, we mean prairies that were never plowed or heavily grazed uh, or heavily impacted by people. And they still maintain a lot of biodiversity, especially in the soil. And the reason I talk about remnant prairies is because these, uh, these remnants are their ancient ecosystems, their ancient species assemblages that can give us a good template to build uh, our restoration goals off of. Next slide. 
And so the first bird species that I want to talk about, I'm going to talk about the two birds and then I'm going to get into the parasitic plants. Uh, but the first species I want to talk about is the bobolink, which is a species that has grown near and dear to my heart uh, in the Chicago area. And hopefully after a minute or two, you guys will have a similar appreciation. So this bird is, is, is unbelievable. It's, uh, it's a long distance migrant. Uh, from South America. So it spends its uh, some of the summer months here in Chicago. It's, it's arriving in our region just about now and stays with us until August or September where it then uh, resumes its southward migration all the way down to the grasslands of Argentina and Uruguay and other parts of South America. So this bird flies literally thousands of miles every year just to breed in our prairies. And so the sense of responsibility that, that I have and a lot of the volunteers have to maintaining habitat, quality habitat for this bird is, is, is really deep. Um, and the reason why we work so hard to restore this habitat is because this is one of the fastest declining species uh, of grassland birds that we see in, the nor in North America. Um, grassland birds as a whole are the most endangered suite of birds in North America right now. And that is usually because uh, many grasslands in the, in the United States are still being rapidly converted to agriculture. Locally, we've seen a trend of, uh, of six, almost 7% loss of its population on an annual basis between the 1960s and the early, uh, and, and 2015. Uh, interestingly, in the Chicago region, we see a, we've seen a 2% increase from 1999 to 2012. Uh, which we think is due to the level of management that we're able to provide. If we know what the bobolinks like and what they require, we can build that into our management plans and goals and try to create that habitat for them. And, you know, this bird is, is so iconic, just like the prairies where we had 22 million acres of prairie and now we've only got about 2,000 left. Bobolinks 100 years ago in the early 1900s were, according to some ornithologists, probably the most common bird in Illinois. And it's now certainly one of the rarest. Next slide, Terry. Oh, go back one. Yep, perfect. And, and so one of the reasons why this bird is so difficult to manage for is because the habitat that we find it in varies so widely across the Chicago area. So on the left, we see one, one kind of bobolink habitat that it tends to, to like a lot in the Chicago wilderness region. And we call this uh, a cool season grassland. So these are uh, grasslands that are dominated by introduced species from mostly from Eurasia. Uh, and these are uh, grasses like brome and fescue and uh, red top and Kentucky bluegrass. Uh, these are species not native to the Midwest, but have, were brought here by European settlers uh, because these plants all act as good forage crops for, for cattle. Um, on the right, we see uh, a warm season prairie restoration. So these are, are, are species that do most of their growing and flowering and seeding in during the warm summer months. Um, and as you can see, they look a lot different and their structures are a lot different. And so both of these patches that we see, the left is southwestern Cook County, Bartell grassland. The picture on the right is northwestern Cook County and Barrington. Uh, bobolinks nest in both of those habitats. Next slide. I And I won't spend tons of time on this because this is just reinforcing things I've already said, but uh, here we can see uh, vegetation height preferences for bobolink and uh, habitat type preferences. So you can see that it likes kind of lower to medium uh, height vegetation. And on the right, it might be a little bit small to see, but those three blue bars on the left all represent cool season grassland habitats. And on the, on the right, it's warm season uh, grassland habitats. So which isn't to say that one is necessarily better for them, for bobolinks than the other, but that in some places they seem to show a pretty strong preference for one kind of grassland over another. Next slide. The second bird I wanna talk about is a little bit less of a, of a <laughs> kind of like a, Hollywood worthy script in terms of its life cycle, but it's it's no less fascinating. It's the grasshopper sparrow here calling out uh, from the grass tops. And uh, this species is not as, as long of a distance migrant. It, it, it overwinters in the southern, southeastern United States and Mexico. 
uh, but we've seen similar declines in its, in its, uh, in its numbers. We've seen a 72% decline in this population of grasshopper sparrows from the mid-60s to 2015. Locally, we see a, 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 about a 6% decrease in population annually. So you can see just how over time that 6% every year adds up to quite a bit. Um, this species is a little bit different from the bobolink. They, this, this bird likes really dry prairies, likes patchy uh, vegetation, uh, short growing vegetation, and a lot of bare ground in between uh, because these birds really run on the ground. A lot of grassland birds spend a lot of their time running on, directly on the ground and so um, plants that can facilitate their movement uh, around the grassland safely hidden from predators are things that they usually tend to respond to. Uh, next slide please. This is a picture of, uh, of a, what I would consider to be kind of a prime uh, grasshopper sparrow habitat in early spring. So while this grassland resembles what would look like a, a pasture after bison or a prairie after bison were, were, uh, were grazing in it, uh, we see a lot of low vegetation, bare dirt. Um, this is actually a gravel hill prairie in, uh, in northwestern Cook County, uh, very high quality. But I just wanted to kind of give you a sense as to what this patchy habitat looks like. Next slide. Similarly to the bobolink, we see a preference for, uh, for some cool season uh, grasslands as according to Jim Herkert's data. Jim Herkert is an ornithologist working here in Illinois. He's the president of Illinois Audubon Society or, or the executive director and he, his, his data has contributed a lot to our grassland bird understanding regionally. Um, and we can see that grasshopper sparrows like short vegetation and they also like bobolink tend to prefer uh, cool season grasslands in some regions. Next slide. So I do want to emphasize that restoration as a whole, prairie restorations or reconstructions, it's a young discipline. Uh, it was born in the Midwest and a lot of the oldest restorations are both in the Chicago area, the Morton Arboretum and at the University of Wisconsin, uh, Madison Arboretum. Uh, it's, a, it's a young discipline. So while we've learned a huge amount over the last 50 years, there's still a lot of gaps in our knowledge and, and a lot of unknowns. Um, and so uh, many restorations from the early 60s into the early 2000s uh, were planted to, uh, with, with a lot of tall grasses. Because this is the eastern tall grass prairie, the emphasis on early restorationists uh, was to establish those tall grasses uh, because that's, that's a species that, uh, that is iconic and found throughout, uh, throughout the region. However, what we found over the years was that prairie, prairies that were planted heavily in tall grasses tended to not harbor tons of wildflower diversity. And so a lot of restorations that we've created tend to start looking like this, which isn't to say that it's not useful habitat. There are other grassland birds that really tend to favor tall vegetation with dead standing vegetation and, un and some unburned prairies like a Henslow sparrow, which is another rare bird, would really like this type of a habitat structure. Uh, next slide. And it's not just the tall grasses that tend to cause these monocultures. Uh, tall goldenrod, which we see here, is another uh, species that is, is native actually, but also acts very aggressively in uh, restoration. So I don't want to necessarily paint with broad brushstrokes and say that every native species acts perfectly and every uh, introduced species is a menace. Uh, because there's there's a lot of uh, gray area in between. But this is one of the native species that can really take a strong foothold in a restoration and can actually be much worse for birds than some tall grasses. Next slide. Uh, not to be a non-native aggressive uh, person right now, um, but uh, I, I, was, I was wondering, Daniel, um, if there is one practice that anyone could do to restore grassland birds, what would it be? Um, it would be to head out to a grassland, uh, to your closest grassland and, and participate in restoration there uh, because these grassland birds really prefer these habitats. Really the best thing we can do for them is to manage these effectively, not only manage them, but monitor them. So uh, under, try to understand how bobolinks are responding to pulling invasive species, spraying with herbicide, uh, cutting down trees in the middle of the prairie, uh, um, collecting seeds and diversifying prairies. Those are all things that, that help improve the habitat and, and improve the outlook for these birds. 
And do you have, uh, how, how many more slides do you have? <laughs> <laughs> Just a few. I'm going to start getting into the, uh, into the uh, hemiparasites, which, which will go quickly. So thanks for keeping me on task. I'll, 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 I'll speed things up a little bit. So I just want to emphasize with this slide that structure, I just want to reinforce structure is a really strong determinant in which grassland birds a prairie is going, going to attract. And that structure will change over the course of a prairie's life if you're starting with a restoration that, that was formerly a cornfield or a soybean field. Um, and so the little patches of yellow that you see are prairie drop seed, which is one of the very important uh, short statured native species that we try to plant in, in a lot of our, our local restorations. And so uh, the emphasis on, on tall grasses is going down and the emphasis on short grasses is going up. Next slide. So one of the ways that the structure was maintained habitat structure heterogeneity was maintained was through bison grazing. So they would, they would, they would graze selectively on forbs and, or sorry, on grasses and leave a lot of the forbs alone. So it kind of fostered this, uh, this habitat structure heterogeneity. But in the absence of bison, how can we maintain that structure and create uh, some heterogeneity? Next slide. And that's one way is through utilizing, harnessing the power of hemiparasitic plants. So the first one I'm going to talk about is wood betony. This is uh, one of the uh, really important plants in a prairie restoration. Uh, this is a species that uh, is hemiparasitic, so it can, it can, it can uh, photosynthesize, uh, but it can also, through a little structure on its roots called a hostoria, can attach to the roots of other plants and steal water and nutrients from it. Um, and it plays a really strong, a big role in restorations because uh, you can seed this species into tall grass monocultures. And what you'll find over time is that uh, the, the growth around the betony will be stunted and then volunteers and staff can go in and seed directly into these patches of low growing vegetation uh, and can create some islands of diversity in amongst the tall grasses. Next slide. Here's just a picture of, of some betony growing in amongst some, some tall uh, Indian grass. Uh, next slide. And we always tend to find betony in these remnants. So again, reinforcing how we use remnants to build templates for our, for our restoration goals. Um, next slide. The next species uh, that I want to talk about briefly is bastard toad flax, one of the most colorfully named uh, plant species we have in the region. Um, this species is unfortunately not as prevalent in our restorations because it's very hard to collect seeds and it seems, uh, and it's, uh, the seeds are impossible to collect and growing them from seed in a nursery setting is, is, is notoriously difficult. Uh, but it's another one that we think if we can get it established in prairies that are monocultures, we can create some diversity from that. Next slide. In the interest of time, I'll skip this slide. That's just a pretty photo I wanted to show you. Next slide. These two, these, th this slide just reinforces what I've, what I've been telling you, that these hemiparasitic species are stunting the growth of a lot of the plants around them. Uh, next slide. The very last parasitic plant I'm going to talk about is dotter, and this is a true parasite. This is a species that uh, germinates on the ground, develops a very small root system that quickly withers away as the plant snakes itself up other plants, and it bores directly into the stem with those hostoria, and it can steal water and nutrients from plants. So similar to the betony and the toad flax, um, this species has a set of, of, of hosts, and, and they tend to prefer uh, uh, goldenrods and sunflowers, which are also uh, aggressive native species that can form monocultures and prairie restorations. And we have seven species of, of dotter locally. My next and final slide, um, just to kind of tie this into uh, how we make, how, how land managers are making decisions on the ground about how to manage prairies. This is from Audubon's climate change report that came out in, in October showing the projected future range of both grasshopper sparrows and bobolinks if, um, if we don't, if we don't curb emissions and ma maintain, uh, a, a, well, not maintain, but minimize the, the level of warming that we're gonna experience in Illinois. So both of these maps are based off of a three degrees Celsius warming scenario. And it's basically showing everything in red is 
is range that these species are projected to lose. So as you can see, the grasshopper sparrow is going to lose some of its range. Uh, and by range, I mean the climactic conditions that these birds need to survive. The bobolink is projected to lose up to 88% of its current range, which is particularly devastating when you consider that everywhere that it's slated to gain habitat in that blue color is smack dab in the middle of the boreal forest where there's not much potential to create grasslands. So for these birds, we have uh, land managers grapple with a lot of questions about managing for one species versus another, both in the short term and in the long term. And so hemi parasites and parasites play a huge role in helping us achieve habitat heterogeneity and structure and give these birds a fighting chance to hopefully survive in Illinois for the long term. So with that, you can go to the last slide. It's just got my email on it, Terry, but I'm um, sorry for uh, taking a bunch of time. I never know when to shut up, but I hope you all learned something. Thanks. Yay. We're going to clap at you with our souls. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Um, you didn't mention the most important hemiparasite to the region, which would be Fismia americana. Um, that I think if we introduce more of those into restorations, we would see a lot more successes uh, for grassland birds. <laughs> um, so I know where to get some seeds. I'll let you know. Uh, all right, our, um, our next presenter is a genius who is also very, very generous with all of her knowledge. Um, she has the, the spirit of May Watts, the idea that you can know a lot and share as much of it with as many people as possible. And she works at the Chicago Park District now. And lucky for them, because uh, she is also the president of the Northeast chapter of the Illinois Native Plant Society. And her dog is uh, really cute. And so <laughs> join me in welcoming Cassie Sari. Thanks, Rob. Um, and also, can you just confirm my microphone is working? I confirm it. Awesome. So thanks for the introduction. I'm uh, really excited to start with the Chicago Park District recently. And as you said, I'm the president of the Illinois uh, Northeast chapter of the Illinois Native Plant Society. So I kind of just wanted to share my experience doing what a lot of you have probably done, which is plant native plants in your home landscape. So what I uh, have done here, and I'll show you a couple of slides for context while I wrangle my dog. <laughs> Um, if I can start the screen share. Is this working? Somebody Look, confirm? Looks good. It looks good. Awesome. So this, if on the left, is like a typical suburban mature uh, development in like Lake County. On the right is my neighborhood in Chicago. You can see the huge difference in the amount of impervious surface, very few trees, even along those sidewalks, um, there's not even much for turf. This is what the, my backyard looked like before I moved in. And it had basically just a, a, a square of turf grass and some pavers. So when I moved in, I decided to plant some native plants, got them from the place I was working at the time laid them out, put them in this back area, and then in about two months it looked like that. Uh, things had already started popping and I actually got a few flowers the first year. So the next year uh, my boyfriend moved in and I suddenly had some free labor which was very useful and actually let me see if this looks better. Um, so we, we pulled up these pavers and we turned them into raised beds. So the garden is kind of half, half, or half uh, food garden and half uh, wildflowers. That's from uh, the back of our apartment. And then we decided to get a little bit more ambitious and get rid of some of that turf gas that nobody was using. So we kind of drew it out and <laughs> Microsoft Paint drew it out to see what it would look like and then used a hose to kind of lay out more smoothly what the area we wanted to remove. And we, we kept a piece of turf gas because we wanted to make sure that people knew that this was an intentional landscape and not just like a vacant lot. Because um, I knew that I wanted to put a bunch of different plants in here. Um, so for the typical landscape, you'd probably want to keep your plant selection pretty simple, but my, my uh, technique was to just throw as many plants in as possible. Found some free wood on the side of the road, put some wood in there for a different habitat for different invertebrates that like to have that kind of 
place to live. So the, this was this, uh, let's see, doesn't that work? This was just uh, the following year. So it was pretty quick how much things popped up. Uh, this was one year, another year later. And um, it's just been a really nice experience. As far as getting the plants, I got them from my place of work, but they're, I think the, my best recommendation is to find a friend who has native plants because they probably have native plants to share. And so let's see, going back to the screen share. So this is what it looks like now at this time of year. There's um, most of our seedlings for the food part are still inside. Um, so we have uh, some pretty bare spots right now, but we'll start planting tomatoes and peppers and other things pretty soon. Got some rhubarb that's already starting to flower. I was really hoping that the shooting star would have started flowering by now, but it's a little bit low on the go. And <clears throat> looks like I'm gonna have a pink one this year, which is nice because I think I just had uh, white ones. So I wanted to show as well the, um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot of people who have a lot of uh, native plants to share. They like to spread around, you know, they're adapted to this climate. And a lot of people, um, I find that a lot of people who have these kinds of gardens are also like the type of people who are willing to share. So these are bluebells. And I thought one thing that I would do is as a gardener, especially if you're planting things from a seed, you often don't know necessarily if the thing that you're seeing is something that you planted or if it's something that is coming up on its own, like a weed that you should uh, be pulling. So for my, for my garden, I had mostly planted with live plugs. And so it was a lot easier for me to know what was the, the species that I was planting and what it was that I was, that are like weeds that are coming up. But one resource that you can use in order to find this type of information, because plant identification is, can, can be really daunting, um, I really recommend using iNaturalist for that. And so this is the iNaturalist app. You have a little profile, you create observations of different species, and it's really meant mostly for wild observations. Of course, there's a helicopter going above me. <laughs> Um, but you can also use it for things that you've planted or, um, you know, every once in a while somebody puts their dog on there. <laughs> I have, I'm pretty sure I have as well. So you would make an observation by clicking this button here. You can take a photo or you can choose one that is in your, um, already in your photo gallery, but I'll do this and I'll take a photo. So I'm here by these bluebells, which I know that they're bluebells, Mertensia virginica. But the cool thing, that well it has grabbed the date the time my location and then you click the species area and it has these automated suggestions based on the picture which is really cool and it actually this is a pretty easily identifiable plant and so it got it on the first try this is indeed virginia bluebells so i'll select that choice and because i did plant these here i'm gonna mark that as captive or cultivated and because it's my backyard i'm also going to change the geo privacy to obscured and that means that it'll show up on the map for everybody else once I upload it, but it will not show the exact location of my backyard just for privacy purposes. So from there, I'm just gonna save it. Um, and then later you could upload that. So I know a lot of people on this call are familiar with iNaturalist, but there's another app that iNat has made called Seek. And uh, it's pretty cool. It's uh, kind of sold as a, it's free, but it's billed as like a, a kid-friendly alternative to iNaturalist. It has, you don't upload your observations to any public database necessarily. You can keep it, everything on the app itself. And so that means that if you're having a kid who's running around using the phone, you know, they're not sending their public location to the world. And so that's why it's uh, safe for kids. There is a feature actually where you can connect your iNaturalist account to it. Um, so that you can use Seek and then kind of use the, this gamified version of iNat. And a lot of people find that to be fun. For example, they have this new one out called the Backyard Challenge, where you have to find five plants, two insects, one arachnid, and two birds. And then you can get a badge for participating in that. So the really cool thing about Seek compared to iNat um, is that it has a, while well, I wrangle my dog, so the seek in the camera 
it knows automatically while you have the camera open um, what species it is. You don't have to wait and take the picture and have it upload it later or try to figure out it later. So it has correctly identified this squirrel-like creature as a domestic dog. Um, and it, it's pretty good with the like kind of the obvious species. So again, it knew this was Virginia bluebells. Um, so I just got part of my way to earning the backyard challenge. And then with some species that when they're not flowering, it can have a little bit more difficulty with. So this is a pretty high level of classification that it's that it's identifying it to. This is actually a penstem and calicosis. Um, I, it has really beautiful kind of tube-like flowers later in the year and uh, one that I would definitely recommend for home landscapes. Different, different species in that same genus, penstem. This one is actually the Kankakee mallow. And again, it's not flowering, so it might have some difficulty with it. Oh, but it does know that it's in the mallow family. And then something even more obscure, like a sedge. It knows that it's in, it, it does know that it's in the genus Carex, true sedges. That, that's just with a, you know, going close to the capturing this picture. And it already knew that it was in the genus Carex, which I don't know, my mind is blown by that. So. <laughs> Hey Cassie. Yeah. What um <laughs> I love that. Uh what what would happen if say a kid was doing the backyard challenge and lo and behold they do see an endangered species and captured in the app? Does it is there a, a flagging process that sends it to iNaturalist or what would happen? Oh, you know? <laughs> there isn't, and that's part of why it's kid safe. Like it's uh, not at all connected to the internet, actually. I could put airplane mode on and it would still function. Wow. Um, but again, if they, you, there is a process that I haven't gone through because I don't have kids, but you can kind of authenticate that you, you are a parent that is allowing your kid to participate in iNaturalist through Seek. So that there is that option, you know, if you have a precocious, precocious child who is interested in observing nature around them, uh, you can do that authentication process and they can then upload their observations to iNaturalist as well. That's great. My, my three-year-old wanted a game that had a pupa in it. And I was never more proud. <laughs> Then again, this is just a comparison. iNaturalist is a lot older, so it's like a little bit, a little bit clunkier. It's a very small development team, but they are really good about getting new features added and fixing issues. So, oh, this actually did know that this is Carex sprangelii that uh, that is planted here in my garden. That's another one I would really recommend for um, for gardens. It comes up early in the spring, so you kind of uh, get that good green foliage early on. Let's see here. Wants me to do Duolingo. Anything else embarrassing? But I think that's all I have. Um, a little bit shorter. Cassie, my assistant. <laughs> um, I love your dog so much. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit to the the iNaturalist uh, data set and the sort of um, academic papers that have been written with that sort of community science forum. Yeah, so iNaturalist, is, it's really interesting in that it's growing, it's doubling pretty much every year for the past four years. And that information can be used, you know, it's, it's mostly just people going out and observing what seems interesting to them at the time. Uh, and, and most people aren't participating in any one citizen science project at a time. But there are specific projects. For example, there was one on looking at the coats of mountain goats and what percentage of the coat in the pictures was shedding. And they were using that and uh, comparing that information to the, the altitude or the elevation and then looking at the time of the year and looking at how the, the shed of the coat may be, uh, uh, how that's being impacted by climate change. There have been new species that have been uh, discovered through iNaturalist photos. Uh, range expansions, invasive species expansions. So really what, what you're adding, you know, I always recommend people just add what they find interesting to them because you never know how it's going to end up being used by others. And um, for me, I use it a lot just like a, a nature journal uh, and to keep, keep tabs on the other people who are nature nerds like me interested in going out and looking at plants. 
Yeah, I love their year in review where it shows you all the species. It has like a little uh, circle of life where you can see like where your observations were in the history of um, living species. And it's a, it's a really great, it's a really great tool. I'm, it's, it's made me, made me a better man. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess one, one uh, project on iNaturalist that I wanted to plug was the Illinois Botanist Big Year. And that is just kind of a friendly competition to see how many plants that you can observe within Illinois in a single year. So last year we had uh, two people observe over 1,100 species of plants in Illinois in a single year, which was the most anybody uh, had ever done on, in our history, which was really amazing. So that's one of our yeah. the Illinois Native Plant Society's projects. And that project's so great because uh, it's definitely pushed me to upload a lot more pictures of plants, and that just improves the data set tenfold. Is this that that you? I mean, in, in essence, that is the the gamifying of uh, you know plant observation because I want to be in the top ten. <laughs> um, all right, well, uh, that was great, Cassie. Can we get a round of applause for Cassie, everyone? Shake our hands. Hey, at her. Thank you, everyone. Um, Thanks for letting me share. Last year's winner is on this call. I'm honored. Um, <laughs> uh, so great job, Cassie. Um, everyone download iNaturalist now. There's a project on there for uh, sidewalk botany because that is definitely where we're at right now. Um, so our next presenter is the restoration manager for citizens for conservation. And uh, they're trying to, what does it say, the expand the restoration footprint in the Barrington area. And so um, they are going to be talking about a really cool way. Um, you know, I, I think one thing that is always interesting to me is, is how um, restoration plans might be uh, affected by what flowers people think are pretty and that they want to put in their restorations. And um, our next presenter is going to be talking about things that a lot of people don't think are pretty. No one on this call, but a lot of people don't think are pretty. So uh, let's give it up for Kevin Shywiller, everyone. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, everyone. Um, so before we get started, let's see. I just want to make known that I've been socially distancing myself from Zoom. So I'm going to hope that this works out good here. Uh, I'm going to try to pull up the presentation. Um, so yeah, as Rob said, I'm the restoration manager for Citizens for Conservation. Uh, we are a small nonprofit uh, in the Barrington area, so northwest suburbs of Chicago. Uh, we work on about 480 acres, and we work with the Lake County, Cook County Forest Preserves too to try and expand out the restoration of a geographical area. Um, but today I'm going to talk to you about the 10 native plants that I spend really a huge majority of my time with, um, and hopefully maybe you will too. Um, but I'm going to talk about the warrior sedges. Uh, this might be a concept that a few of you have heard about before. Um, so this is all put together from Tom Vanderpool, who was our restoration manager for the past, I think, 30 or 40 years. Um, and he really had the insight for um, everything that you see here today. And this is really kind of his brainchild. So I'm, I'm really honored, A, to be on this call with you all. Um, I know there's a lot of great restoration practitioners out there, a lot of great presenters today. And then um, really just kind of honored to be able to uh, carry on this tradition and hopefully share it all with you. Um, so before I introduce you to the different warrior sedges, um, there's 10 different species. I just want to go over some kind of broad strokes with this whole plan here. So the idea is that these 10 sedge species um, are going to help us rebuild wetlands. And unfortunately, I don't have a whole lot of time today to get into the, the whole nuts and bolts on how to do that. But we'll touch on some of that as well as introduce you to the species. So uh, off here in the background, uh, you see this is our Flint Creek Savannah property uh, located right in the heart of Barrington there. Um, and then here's Flint Creek itself, which is one of the, uh, the sub watersheds of the Fox River. Um, so this is a, a nice sedge meadow restoration that we have going on here. It's probably about, uh, well, it's varying degrees, but you know, it's, it's about six to seven years old. Uh, you see there's a fair amount of diversity, got a lot of great blue lobelia. Uh, some cardinal flowers, sneeze weeds starting to bloom, uh, blue vervain, joe pie weed, and tons and tons of those ugly plants that Rob pointed out, those sedges. Um, so let's get into who the sedges are. 
So before we get too deep into that, though, um, I did want to bring up. So then this is this should look somewhat familiar. A not only because it's the same location about seven years beforehand, but really this is the classic urban wetland nowadays. Um, for a lot of different reasons, our wetlands have been completely degraded. A lot of excess nutrients from runoff, a lot of surges in stormwater. You name it. It's really created this ecosystem that honestly I I thought myself was somewhat native, you know, growing up in the area, I thought cattails were a native plant and cattail marshes were a nice thing. It was only until, you know, fairly recently that I found out most cattails we're seeing aren't really native. And so this ecosystem that's been created is basically dominated by what I'm going to call the wetland thugs today. So who are the wetland thugs? Uh, it's the big three. We got reed canary grass here. Um, that's all these ugly seed heads that you see up in the foreground. Uh, all those brown nasty seeds that are going to fall out under that area. Um, so non-native really creates these monocultures. And then off in the background here, we have the, uh, the non-native or the hybrid cattail. Um, so there is a native cattail, um, you know, for those of you out there that uh, know a thing or two about the cattails. But really when you see these dense monocultures of cattails, it's more often than not the hybrid cattail. Um, and that's the hybrid between the native and the non-native. And it creates these really dense mats where really nothing hangs on. Um, you know, sedge, flowers, birds, you name it, they don't really use these areas. Then lastly, way off in the background, we got the other one, Phragmites, also creates these giant monocultures. But don't worry, we did have a little bit of diversity there. Uh, to the trained eye, you can see there's some uh, field thistle here, nice, beautiful purple bloom. So, I'm sure a lot of people on this call today have done some sort of wetland restoration and have had varying capacities of success. Wetlands are probably one of the most fun, but also frustrating things to try to restore, right? There's oftentimes you could get pretty big gains, but you could also get really big backslides. Um, the wetland seed bank seems to hold on. So sometimes that does help you. You go in and you nuke out a whole area of reed canary grass or cattails, and the very next year, all of a sudden you got these sedges and wildflowers poking up where you had no idea they were there before. That's best case scenario. Most often it's you go in, you nuke out an area, and guess what's back the next year? Reed canary grass again. But, you know, by using this technique that I'm going to go over, we found a way to start to mitigate that and make our wetland um, restorations more resilient against that reinvasion. And to really the backbone of this is the warrior sedges. <clears throat> so, this concept and the 10 different species I'm going to talk about were really, they were formulated by going around different remnant areas. So that's stream sides, uh, remnant marshes, remnant, you know, just wet meadows, sedge meadows, you name it. And, you know, over the past 20 years, Tom and other volunteers from our organization noticed that there were some of these sedge species that kept on popping up again and again. I got them to thinking, you know, why were these 10 different species continually hanging on in an area where reed canary grass or phragmites might be trying to take over? And one of the really, the common traits that they kept on realizing is that all these different sedge species are really highly rhizomatous. Um, so what's kind of cool about that, and I, I, I'm not a sedge expert, I'm not a plant expert in general, but the rhizomes are these long lateral shoots that will send up new stalks. So it's kind of its main reproductive strategy, right? So instead of spreading by seeds, it spreads through these underground shoots that will send up vegetative uh, stalks. And it creates these dense colonies. And what's kind of cool about that is those dense colonies will actually form a tight matrix that keeps out those wetland thugs from reinvading your area. So before I introduce you to our 10 warrior sedges, um, I just wanted to go over the fact that, you know, a wetland is a wetland, right? Mm, yes and no. There's all these different little microcosms and different, you know, small differences to wetlands. So we tried to break the warriors out into three different categories. Um, so the first one we're going to call the emergent. Uh, sedge warriors. The emergents are your deep marsh sedges. So think about an area that's always wet. You know, bogs, kettle, wetlands, things of that nature. Um, you know, they really don't dry out. Maybe, just maybe, in a really dry year in August they'll dry out. But for the most part, there's pretty much standing water. Our next category is your seasonally inundated sedges. So that's kind of a step back from your the, the eye of the wetland, per se. So right now actually is a great time, like April and May with all the storms coming through, it'll get really wet. But then come July and August, there won't be standing water, but the soil is always really, really mucky. So if you're wearing tennis uh, shoes or boots, 
stepping in this area, you're going to like, you know, have to pull your shoe out kind of deal still. So it's still a really wet area. Maybe there's no standing water. And then lastly, hope you can see behind all the faces here, uh, is a sedge meadow. And the sedge meadow is an area where there typically won't be much standing water, but there's hydric soil. And that's soil that, you know, is formed under wetland conditions. So let's meet the warriors. Um, when I was trying to put this together, I was trying to think about, you know, whether to use the common names or the Latin names. Uh, the good news or the bad news is they're both awful, so we get to deal with that. Um, so we'll just jump right into it. <clears throat> so first up, we have Carex utriculata, which is the common yellow lake sedge. Uh, presumably, it probably got its name from these yellow perigenia here. Um, and perigenia is just a fancy way of saying seed sac or, you know, the capsule where the actual seeds are. Um, this is kind of a cool plant. It'll form dense thickets, and it's actually one of the, uh, the species that will form the, um, the floating mat of bogs. Um, so like in glacial lakes and stuff like that, the, when you see like those floating mats, this is one of those species that does that. This one's not super duper common, but uh, we find it a fair amount of times out in the northwest suburbs. Next up is Carex stricta, or the common tussock sedge. Uh, this is a super duper cool plant. Um, I'll try to make it brief, but so basically, this plant typically grows in really, really wet areas, standing water most of the year. And there's a certain ant species that will go in and cut the leaves off of this, and then it will lay at the, at the base of the sedge itself. And it kind of uses that to decorate its home and build up a little nest underneath these plants. And so you think about uh, ants, you know, piling leaves up, right? Not a whole lot of gain most years, but they'll do this every single year. And over time, that mound slowly, slowly starts to build. So now in some of these remnant areas that have been evolving since the last glaciers moved out, some of these could get up to a meter tall. So think about how many years of ants cutting down leaves and stacking those up to get to a meter tall tussock sedge. What's cool then is that there's actually like a little island sticking up and out of the wetland itself and creating its own little microcosm. Really fascinating plant, fascinating ecology. Um, so next up we have Carex aquatilis, the long brack tussock sedge. So Similar name to the common tussock sedge, but this one doesn't actually form tussocks. Uh, don't know why they call it a tussock sedge. It's for someone smarter than I to tell you. Um, and then we have one of the huge workhorses of the warriors here, and this is Carex lacustris, or common lake sedge. Great plant, uh, very typical of a lot of the prairie pothole wetlands that you find out in this area. Uh, it forms these really dense, thick, rhizomatous colonies. It's a really stout plant, one of the first ones that I'll typically see coming up during the year with some great, uh, you know, blue, purple, or blue green foliage. Okay, so now we're stepping out of like the deep wetland. We're moving up into that inundated area. So first up for that is Carex trichocarpa, the hairy fruited lake sedge. Um, Rob had a great segue into that because this is a huge cash crop for insects. Um, so typically when we think about, you know, plants for insects, we're thinking about our asters, milkweeds, stuff like that. This is a larval food source for, I think, 17 different insect groups. So like katydids, leafhoppers, grasshoppers, grass skippers, um, some different obligated wetland uh, butterflies. They all use this sedge for their larval food source. So it might not be the most attractive plant in the world, but it has a ton of value for the insects. Next up, we have the riverbank sedge, Carex amorei. Uh, this is one of the few warrior sedges that we use that actually does pretty well with shade. Um, most of these other ones have adapted to full sunlight conditions, but this one, you know, growing on riverbanks probably grew underneath some shade of, um, you know, different trees that would have been growing along uh, floodplain forests as well. Uh, we got running marsh sedge, Carex artwellii, and then hairy-leaved lake sedge, Carex athros. Um, don't have too much fun facts about those, but and they're all beautiful in their own sort. And you really start looking at these things and there's certain colors that pop on them and they're, they're really, they're great plants. Really, really frustrating to try to identify, but fun plants when you start to get to know them a little better. And so lastly, we have our sedge meadow species. And we only have two of these. These are again, those areas that are wet, I would call it maybe somewhat of a transitional zone from up and out of your marsh or your wetland into your wet prairie. And so our two species for that are Carex buxbamii, the dark scaled sedge. Um, I think a lot of people call it the ash cream cone sedge. I like that name a lot. It might be a stretch, but so you see the, the base of this spike here kind of has that cylindrical cone shape and then a bunch of scoops of ice cream on top. Might be a stretch, but once you see it, you can't unsee it. 
Um, and then lastly, Carex Polita, the broadleaf woolly sedge. Uh, this is another workhorse for our wetland restorations. Um, it's really kind of my go-to and I have no idea what the wetland looks like. Is it going to dry out? Is it going to stay wet? If I don't know, Carex Polita is always the one that goes to it. It seems to find its way wherever it wants to. What's cool is I've seen it growing right up and out of the creek, all the way up a bluff onto, you know, more or less a dry prairie. Okay, so like I said, I mean, we could, I could talk to you about this for probably another hour, hour and a half, but I'll spare all of you for that. Um, but so we like to use these sedges to rebuild our wetlands, and I'm just going to give you the real broad strokes on how we do that. So what's cool here is that this is a, a swale that six years ago was all reed canary grass. Uh, we had a really nice established prairie in the background there with all the, the silphiums blooming. But we always kind of saved our wetlands for last because we were never having good luck at it. But so through using this technique, we we're able to uh, return that reed canary swale into a nice diverse sedge meadow. And what's kind of cool about this is that we're not replacing one monoculture with another monoculture. You know, we're not just replacing reed canary grass with a monoculture of a certain sedge species. These sedges have, you know, co-evolved with these plants for hundreds of thousands, or no, excuse me, uh, tens of thousands of years. Um, and so you see that you get your swamp milkweeds, you get your blue vervain. Um, there's some water hemlock hiding out in here too. They all seem to know how to grow with the sedges. So real fast, uh, dirty, you know, down dirty with this is, the idea is what we do is we'll find an area we always choose an area and we don't bite off more than we could chew. It's something that we know that we could go through and we could herbicide and then follow up with sedges or sedges and then seeds as well too. So that's when we start putting our forbs in is through seeds. So what you see here is your receding line of the reed canary grass. And then in here, what we do is we'll come in and we'll treat an area. We'll typically spray it off twice, um, once in the fall and then again in the spring. Um, we'll use glyphosate for the most part. Um, unless there's remnant vegetation hanging on, then we'll try and treat that in a different way. But after we feel fairly confident that we've knocked back the, the bad guys, at least enough, then we'll introduce these warriors. And we, we choose the warriors based on those different wetland categories, you know, the emergent, inundated, or sedge meadow. And we'll plant them on three foot centers to form a nice tight matrix here. The reason we do that, it's uh, the most economical. It seems to fill in pretty quickly without breaking the bank. Um, for anyone that buys plants, you know, they're, they're not cheap. Um, it's about $1.50 a piece normally for these. But so what's cool is you see a no treatment area. You see, so this is sprayed fall, spring, and then planted. This is probably around June. And then you'll see the very next year and that the, these sedges start to fill out really, really quickly. And it's all due to that rhizomatous nature. Again, they start filling out that matrix and creating a, a ecosystem that doesn't really allow the bad guys to reinvade. Now that being said, they'll definitely still try to get back in. And you have to constantly maintain these areas for the first five to seven years, but after that time, they seem to be fairly self-sufficient. So real- Kevin. Go ahead. Uh, you, how many more slides do you think that you have? Just out of curiosity. Uh, probably about 40. Oh, cool, cool. Um, good night, <laughs> no, everyone. Two minutes. Okay, great, that's right. great. So, this is great, quick. I love it. No, I, I could listen to this all night. They're all pictures too, so it's like a nice picture show. I'll just put you on mute then. Perfect, okay. I'm gonna keep going. <laughs> um, so just real fast, I just wanna show you kind of an area that we've been working on. This is five different locations and it's five different um, years in the process. So this is no treatment at all. So monoculture, reed canary grass. The next year is, you know, after we sprayed it out, you'll see that the, the perennial weed pressure has decreased a bunch at the, the, the weedy, you know, in parentheses, uh, native species start coming through, the blue vervain, some of the nut sedges, and believe it or not, we planted this all at the warrior sedges. You just don't see them yet because it's going to take them a little bit to grow out. By year two, you see these warrior sedges start to really fill out the area quickly. Um, we left a ton of the reed canary grass in the stream bank. Story for another time. But see, this is where this comes into handy, is that a lot of the, the reed canary grass still pokes through these areas, and that's when we come in and we'll use our grass-specific herbicides. Um, I didn't get to touch much on that, but it's a really effective tool to be able to really stunt the growth of this reed canary grass while really not damaging the sedges at all. Even though sedges look like grasses, they're not grasses. And by year three, you'll start to see your, uh, your forb mix start really coming on quickly. And then by year four, you more or less have got a nice self-sufficient wetland. Obviously, you have to go back through and, you know, clean the areas up. There's always going to be new invasions, especially when you have a wall of cattails over there. But, 
you know, through this process, we've been able to restore a decent amount of wetland on our properties and it's given us some hope for the future. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. That's very incredible. Um, I, I do have one quick question is uh, how, is it hard to grow these things at home? Like if you want to start growing warrior sedges in your home garden? Yeah, great question. Um, so it's the, the both the blessing and the curse of them. Um, they spread really quickly through rhizomes, uh, which means that their seed actually has a very low germination rate. I think 10% is a pretty uh, optimistic number. But what we've noticed is that, you know, in a really well-established uh, sedge meadow, we'll go and dig up a small little clump. And that small little clump, you could turn into a hundred different little startlings. So you sit there and you literally tease them apart and you can turn that into a hundred different ones. So after wow. a while, it actually turns into a beachhead for you to be able to uh, further push it along to your next area. So you just have to learn how to be tender with them. No, you can actually be pretty rough. Oh, wow. That's great. Uh, Excellent. Uh, okay, so I have lots more questions, obviously, but we're going to go to our last speaker and then we can do a little bit more Q&A at the end. So thank you, Kevin. Um, I'm going to shake my hands at you again. Uh, our final speaker is uh, a project manager with the Chicago Park District. She is a doctor <laughs> and she is, <laughs> she's got an awesome uh, she's actually in the field right now. Um, I don't know if you can tell. She is uh, in in Big Marsh right now. And uh, I say this every time I talk about her, but we've known each other since high school. We went to the same high school and we'll go do punk rock shows together. So uh, <laughs> for some reason, we're still friends. Uh, and she is going to be talking about her work um, doing habitat restoration and recreation in the Calumet region. Um, so here we go, Lauren Umek. Awesome. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome. Um, so I'm closing it out with um, sort of some weird habitats um, on the southeast side. Um, this is something I've been talking a lot about with my colleague, um, Dr. Allison Anastasio at University of Chicago. Um, and so uh, I'll give you a tour of one of, one of my favorite places in, in Chicago. Um, so if we think about conservation sort of at this really broad scale, um, that all of us are pretty interested in, um, we kind of break down all of our priorities, I, I think in roughly um, this order. So the first are our high quality remnants. So remnants that haven't really been developed, are in good condition, we protect them from development, we manage them for biodiversity um, and as key habitats for important species or communities. After that, we tend to focus on degraded remnants. So remnants that have been impacted by human activity or invasive species. We manage those again for biodiversity. Then we start to think about um, converted landscapes. So, so most commonly in our area, of course, those are um, lands that have been converted into agriculture. So corn and soybean crop. Um, we usually break up drain tiles to restore the hydrology, restore the wetlands and the grasslands that were there before the farm fields. And then we get into these sort of created landscapes that are sort of more typical of urban and suburban areas. So parks, gardens, parkways, green roofs. These are landscapes that are a little bit smaller, um, but in closer proximity to people and still have a lot of ecological value. So those are sort of our top four ways that we focus conservation, um, at least locally and probably globally. Um, then what? There's sort of these other categories um, of land throughout our Chicago landscape um, and we kind of ignore those. So that's what I'm going to um, talk about. So to think about that, let's, I'm going to focus on the Calumet region, which is sort of in the southern tip of Lake Michigan. So this is a good area because this is where kind of all four of those priorities all come together. Um, so there's a combination, Daniel talked before, about the tall grass prairies where they meet with the um, woodlands of the east. So we have this nice sort of mosaic of natural history, dune and swale ecosystems in this region. And remnants are intermixed with neighborhoods. Um, but there's also a lot of land here that sort of falls into that other category. Not remnants, not degraded. Um, not sort of neighborhood gardens, but something else. 
Um, from a developer's perspective in the late 1800s and through the 1900s, this very cool ecosystem mosaic was really viewed as areas to dump stuff. Um, so a lot of these places were shipping corridors or otherwise useless wastelands to, to put materials you don't want anymore. So if we start with our natural history, that brings us into the industrial history of the region. Um, so slag dumping was an important part of building Chicago and the metropolitan region. Um, it also is a big part of modifying a lot of the landscape in the Calumet region. So this is, this is slag dumping. This is a byproduct of the steel industry. So once the steel has been refined, this is sort of the leftover stuff that doesn't make for, for good quality steel for building. Um, pretty easily dumped in as molten metal stuff um, from these cars and it looks real cool. Um, it ends up being not very cool. Um, so these were sort of dumped throughout the region um, and a lot of these slag fields were just left alone for several decades since there. Um, the last slag dumping was in about the, the 1990s, so we're looking at about 30 years um, of these slag fields kind of sitting there in the region. So um, that's what is slag. Um, so it's this byproduct of the steel industry. It has um, a lot of different types of metal. There's a lot of different types, sizes, textures. Um, it looks like rocks, if you didn't know any better, or an abandoned parking lot. If you were like, hmm, this is something weird that someone left there. Um, so what is slag? And more importantly, at least in the um, Calumet region, is where is slag? And this map sort of shows it's everywhere. Um, most of the shoreline and a lot of the Calumet region is covered in a variety of types of slag. Um, and it's about, this covers about 20 square miles um, of this region of slag. So this is that other category. Um, so what is the conservation value of this stuff that got dumped um, into wetlands? So here's a picture um, of a slag area. So when we talk about conservation or restoration on these landscapes, we don't really have best management practices for establishing habitat on slag. Daniel talked about restoration ecology as being a pretty young field. Um, we haven't really touched too much on these kind of landscapes. What do we do here? Um, and a lot of our typical practices don't really apply in this landscape. But if we think about slag spaces, sort of from an ecological perspective, we can start to look a little bit at what the potential is. So if you think about slag as soil, as a soil ecologist, I tend to do that. Um, it's got low permeability, low organic matter. It looks, this is an area um, at Big Marsh that I like to call Mars because it is red and rocky. Um, it has high pH, high heavy metals. And so what lives in these slag landscapes? Um, generally, they're relatively degraded. There's a lot of cottonwoods, glossy buckthorn, um, purple loose strife, a lot of our typical invasive species we see, but they're also in sort of a stunted um, growth form. So they tend to be short and a little scraggly versions of what we would typically see. But what also lives in some of these slag landscapes are some really amazing um, native plants. So some of our slag prairies look more like prairies where liatris thrive, butterflies are using them, um, and they are full of a lot of insects. To even further complicate our slag prairies, sometimes there are very cool and sometimes rare native species growing on the slag. So here's just a couple examples, and, and I used common names here. Um, golden sedge, little green sedge, and probably one of my favorites because the name is so cool, um, Obi-Wan Kenobia <laughs> on slag. So this is Obi-Wan Kenobia on, um, growing on some chunks of slag. And even still some very cool and rare species that you would see that might resemble some local um, native ecosystems. So here we've got Calms lobelia, milkwort, and ladies trust is one of our, um, our native orchids. So if we think about these slag landscapes, it's kind of neat that these are places where native plants and even sometimes rare plants exist, persist, and even proliferate. So is this something that makes the ecological potential of these sites uh, a little bit higher than we initially thought? Um, so this is something we've been exploring and are still kind of in the early um, idea phases of this. So it started us thinking, um, are slag prairies their own novel ecosystem? 
Um, so if we look at this from a global scale, there's actually some similarities of slag prairies to other ecosystems across the world. Um, so these are two different pictures of all of our ecosystems on the one on the left from Sweden, the one on the right in Ontario. Um, so if you look at these images, they're not super different from the ones I showed a second ago. Um, there are also some similarities of slag prairies to some of our local ecosystems. So the dolomite prairies, this image on the left um, at Ted Stone and the one on the right at Medewin. And again, so here is one of our slag prairies at Marion Burns. Um, so you can see the visual similarities of these ecosystems to some of those across the globe. Um, and this is that olivar system in uh, Sweden and some of the lakeside daisies that are growing there. So I explored this a little bit. I'm not going to talk about the, um, the details of this, but I think Terry will post the, a link to this journal. Um, Zhu et al. Hung Xing is an undergrad, um, or now he's a grad student, but he was recently an undergrad at University of Chicago. And we were sort of exploring these things in more detail on slag and non-slag sites. And he wrote an um, article that is a free open source, so you can look at all the amazing graphs we made um, and look at the data to show it. Um, but what I'll give you in one slide is a summary of what that paper says. Um, so what do we do with these weird uh, slag post-industrial landscapes? What does this mean for us? Um, and really, slag is not an ecological wasteland uh, full of invasive species, but actually has the potential to harbor some rare um, native plants. And given some of those analogs to very cool global ecosystems and local rare ecosystems, it potentially could harbor more rare plants that haven't actually gotten to the site on their own. Um, so this is early thought process um, and just, yeah, putting it out there as food for thought. So I think I went nice and fast so we have time for, for chats. Uh, great job, Lauren. Uh, I love, I, really appreciate the sort of looking at the region as a um, basically a, a giant slag field <laughs> and um, what what habitat potential that has. I, I know uh, going back to Daniel's talk too that with the bobolinks they've been observed preferring our non-native grasses uh, just as much as the natives and there are these, these places can still be habitats. These places can still be mm -hmm. homes for uh, animals and, like you say, the the rareish plants um, that you show. Have you? What's been the most surprising thing you've seen growing or using sl slag slag bitat? <laughs> trying to coin that. I I mean I'm a sucker for the fact that we have native orchids that are rare throughout the state and pretty common on slag. First of all, it was cool for me to learn that there were native orchids. Um, they're not the ones that are as flashy as the ones you get at like Trader Joe's and Home Depot. Um, but the fact that we have um, native orchids and they are just, you know, you're, you're almost tripping over them um, in abundance. So that's, that's the coolest part to me. We have a couple questions in the chat. Um, one of them is, can it be dangerous working in these areas with all the heavy metals? I know, uh, Big Marsh has had a, a what, what do they call it, the industrial history, the legacy left over. Um, what's the danger there? Yeah, so that's not my area of expertise per se, but for the most part, the slag is relatively self-contained. Um, so you shouldn't be eating like spoonfuls of it for lunch um, and that just sort nibbles. of a thing. Just, yeah, tiny bites. Um, more of our contamination is actually related to people fly dumping. Um, so cars and car parts. Um, and the battery acid and the oil and all of that gunk, um, because that's more mobile usually. Um, so yeah, not, not a thing to eat. Wash your hands before you eat. We all know about washing our hands a lot now. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to roll around in it, um, but. When you do, another question um, is when you uh, cap the wetlands with clay, do you put things on top of the caps? Yeah, that's a super good question and something we're, we're working on now. So um, in another section, so most of those um, slag photos were in Big Marsh. Um, and where we've been capping is areas where it's been more sort of car parts type of dumping than slag. 
Um, and that's, that's the new thing we're sort of looking at is you have various fill, various dumping of whatever people felt like they wanted to dump. And then we put clay on top of it to put a barrier between the contaminated stuff and people. And now plants should grow on it. Uh, what are those plants? How do we make that work? Um, so that's actually something we're, we're exploring um, in some experimental thoughts this summer um, with a grad student at the Botanic Garden to see how can we amend those clays and get some kind of habitat value on that weird sort of layer cake of soils. Yeah, it's, I don't want to say a dirty word for this group, but it's like, it's almost like a, a stewarded novel ecosystem. <laughs> it's like, what, what, this has already been ruined by people, so how can we make the best out of it and uh, not continue to poison animals and ourselves? There's another question about comparing <laughs> uh, slag fields and areas of serpentine soil. I don't know what that is. What, do you know what serpentine soil is? Is that uh, soil made by snakes? <laughs> Probably. Uh, it sounds like I need to go to California and the Appalachian. Um, for a work trip to do some field studies. I think you should. I think you should. And also to Sweden. Oh, yeah. there we go. High pH, high metal content. Thanks, Derek. Uh, I'll talk to my boss about a, a travel. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, I'm sure there are things that are, uh, can be specialized for that, that landscape. Do people have questions for all of our presenters that they would like to ask now? This is also the time that my toddler starts to scream. So I'm gonna be like <laughs> actively muting the, the microphone. Um, Mary has a question. What is the best milkweed for a garden? I have my own personal opinions. I found that swamp milkweed can grow in containers, which is really nice. <laughs> Agreement. I mean, I feel like butterfly weed is, uh, can you hear the screaming? Uh, butterfly weed is definitely a supermodel um, also. And uh, you can also see lots of monarchs using it. Any other questions? Sorry, I'm gonna to have to ask my co-presenters to unmute themselves to answer some of these questions uh, just because of the awesome screaming happening in my house right now in these unprecedented times. <laughs> um, I see that uh, someone asked, are there native forbs or shrubs you think would do well under heavily shaded acidic conditions beneath conifers? Um, I know there's a lot of good plants for shade, um, there are definitely good lists of, of uh, woodland native plants. Um, under conifers, anyone have any recommendations? Yeah, I think it's how, uh, how Evan, Evan uh, Barker commented in the chat that it's, it, it, a lot of it has to do with light levels, but especially with under the conifers, um, Sometimes you could be dealing with uh, somewhat acidified soil and, and it makes things a little bit difficult, but maybe looking beyond to some uh, serpentine soil, uh, the species might, uh, might do the trick, but, um, but yeah, likely, likely not. A good point about butterfly milkweed not being good for beginners, especially from seed, um, but uh, still it's so, so handsome. 
Um, someone else wanted to know of the of our panelists, what new restoration projects are you like? What's next? What's on the horizon? What are you excited about? That's uh, that we're gonna fix and and make better, and and no one will ever be sad there again. No, you're not excited about anything. I'll I'll throw it out there. Um, kind of kind of in the vein of my my talk. Um, I think Hackmatack National Wildlife Refuge, which is uh, in, in northern parts of McHenry County and Lake County in southern Wisconsin, uh, is, a, is, is an interesting one because it's currently uh, some, some grasslands, some, some restorations peppered in with a whole bunch of uh, burn fields and uh, degraded floodplains like Kevin was showing. Um, and so it's this interesting place where farming is probably going to be a part of the story of Hackmatack for a long time and finding ways to get maximize the conservation benefits of, of, uh, of farming in, in a way that is kind of that works with the land and not against it is really interesting and could have some implications for how we build uh, grassland restorations going forward because normally we tend to think of it being all or nothing and, and other other sites have had similar trajectories like Nechusa grasslands, Medewin, obviously all uh, contain uh, agricultural parcels within their boundaries, but um, it's, it's just interesting um, to see these because of the size of these sites. We're talking thousands of acres and, and that's just something we don't see normally in our area. That's a, that's a good one. And, and I would, I mean, I told you guys what I'm excited about is, is sort of the potential of some of these weird forgotten landscapes um, post-industrial. Um, and then otherwise, I think there's been a lot of um, work along the river um, and the river system, the Chicago River, the Des Plaines River, um, all three branches um, extending the great work that the North Branch group has done, but that's sort of um, leading into, in, in a great way, into the city proper. And I think that's been pretty, pretty exciting to see us think about the river as a thing we value rather than a thing we hide from. Um, I, I should ask our hosts, should we wrap up soon? Yeah, we should wrap up soon. Well, uh, I, I'd say um, where can one procure daughter is a, a really good question. Um, like I said, I, I saw some growing on the Lawrence exit uh, <laughs> off of 9094. Um, I know uh, Kevin commented how it's actually a noxious farm weed, so you're not allowed to transport it. Um, so that's cool. Uh, I know that some restorations collect seed from it. Um, so just look for that weird orange wire stuff and uh, talk to the landowner and get, get some of the seeds for your own, uh, your own parasitic dreams. Um, so there's a lot of great stuff in chat and I'm wondering, um, will the chat be available for reading later? Are you guys going to save the chat? For participants? Yes, great. There's been a lot of great stuff in here, some questions that didn't get answered. Um, very thankful people. Uh, it's really great to see all of you uh, still out there and caring about plants, even though we're kind of vegetative ourselves these days. And uh, it's been a true, a true joy uh, to do this. And now we have to go back to our boring old lives. Um, uh, just as a plug, I will be doing a nature poetry workshop. Uh, with the Morton Arboretum next week, um, if you're into that as well. And uh, the rest of our presenters, can we get another round of applause for them uh, who will be around and their contact information will be shared, I think. And um, yeah, uh, oh look, there's links right there. Um, I'm very grateful for your existence. Thank you all so much. Thank you to Audubon Great Lakes. Um, and uh, Daniel, you have something you have to say. Yeah, you just you just mentioned Audubon Great Lakes, which is a perfect seg segue into. I just wanted to shout out that we've got some other webinars coming up, including on Monday one about black terns, which are probably one of the coolest bird species you didn't know was native to the Chicago region. Um, and yep, Terry's sharing that. And then on Saturday we've got a bilingual uh, bird walk with our uh, data coordinator Refugio Mariscal. He's going to be walking around Greenbelt Forest Preserve in Waukegan. Um, which is a great site for migration this time of year since it's so close. And there's the black term one. So thanks for emceeing this, Rob. Uh, love, uh, love having you around and facilitating all this.
Uh, I love you too. Um, yeah, well, clap for me. And uh, enjoy your beer, Daniel. Uh, thank you all so much. Um, stay safe and uh, put some sidewalk weeds onto iNaturalist. And uh, we'll see you. We'll see you soon. Bye for now. <laughs>